shocking things are taking place in public schools. And we're going to talk in the second segment about what is taking place and specifically what you can do to protect your children and your grandchildren. But first, I want to talk to someone who is an, an expert with regards to small businesses in the United States, the impact of government decisions and policies, including uh, crime policies on small businesses. Uh, a gentleman who has been on, on different programs before, Neil Cavuto's show very many times on Fox Business Channel, uh, et cetera. Uh, we have with us on the program Craig Huey. Craig, thank you for joining us. Hey, Brad, it's great to be here. Thank you. Now, Craig, you have a, a marketing company, correct? That's correct. It's a advertising agency, and uh, I've had it for forty years. Right, and you have a, a strong reputation. You've, in fact, you've been, as I said before, uh, a number of times on uh, the Neil Cavuto show and, and other broadcasts and other other programs, dealing with the challenges to small businesses. But you're also a Christian, a committed Christian, and so you understand that there's uh, challenges, spiritual challenges that are taking place with regards to the business environment and small business environment, particularly in places where you have you know, high business regulation like Illinois, New York, Massachusetts, California, et cetera. Uh, what are, um, first off, what are some of the challenges that you see taking place as we look at this, this merger between uh, the Christian worldview and the business culture? Uh, very good question, Brad, because you see, for a Christian business owner, Everything revolves around our relationship with Jesus Christ. We operate out of a Christian worldview where our ministry is to employees, it's to the vendors, and it's to our customers. And so when we take a look at our witness, we're salt and light. Our mission field is very, very definite, defined, and we need to be able to uh, advocate uh, a, a, a Christianity to be able to spread the good news of Jesus Christ, but we're seeing more and more restrictions coming upon us. That uh, as we look at different state legislation and we look at the national legislation, we're really concerned about being a witness for Christ. Like, like in what way? Why would you be a? Con why would it be a concern? Well, I, you know, when, when I've been on uh, national TV, I often talk about the re uh, the attack on religious freedom. Right. That's coming to the bakers and the florists and to the videographers. Right. Right now, before the Supreme Court, Jack Phillips with Masterpiece Cake Shop, he's he he's now waiting to find out if his uh, bakery, which was a witness for Jesus Christ. Uh, if he's going to be able to have freedom of conscience, if he's going to be right. able to exercise his First Amendment rights, and uh, the same thing happens with with other people in, in, who are Christians, they've been under attack. Uh, they've been under attack here in California by um, the regulators, yeah. and even uh, uh, people suing. Uh, uh, for example, a gay and lesbian, uh, um, a, a lesbian couple wanted to get married, and uh, they went to Arlene's Flowers, and they had been customers for many years. And Brad, what happened was they asked uh, 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 the florist if she'd be willing to do their wedding. And she said, I, lo I love you with the love of my Lord, but I just cannot mm. sell you these flowers and do the decorations uh, 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 you know, for the wedding, but... You, you can go down the street, and they'll do your entire wedding. Right, and then did that couple understand that and say, okay, I respect your faith and your right to believe your faith? They didn't, did they? Instead, they sued, right? They sued, and she could lose <laughs> her house, her 401k, and she's, Everything. What, I think, 72 years old. Right, yeah, and it is, it is so cruel and underhanded uh, for people just to do that, to have such disrespect for people's faith. Now, if we're, not, if we're talking about, Craig... Someone who's pretextually saying, "You blankety blank blank blank," um, I don't, uh, I don't want to have to serve you because I'm claiming to be religious. I mean, we're not talking about that. People using re religious religion as a pretext to be bigoted and, and against anyone or any you know any group. We're talking instead about individuals who have sincerely held religious beliefs about uh, promoting a particular activity or an, a, an event, a religious event, which is a wedding that violates their sincerely held religious beliefs and convictions of what they think God wants them to do. 
I don't see why we have as a society, why we have such a problem with that. But it, we do. And as a small businessman, uh, that's something that you're seeing uh, and you're having to be more alert for uh, in the last few years, correct? That is correct. You know, many gays, many lesbians, many people who would be considered liberal politically, they would agree that a person should have the right, right. to be able to believe without interference by, gov- by the government. But then there's so many on the progressive left. So many people right. who are trying to force us to be marginalized. I, I think, it, you know, there, there was this videographer who had the same situation. Uh, you know, she could not do a, a gay wedding. And she, the, the, the couple had many choices, but they sued her. Right. And, and in the Supreme Court of New Mexico, a, a judge named Richard uh, Boston, he said, this is the price of citizenship. Christians must compromise, if only a little, to accommodate the contrasting uh, values of others. Oh, uh, so people in America must compromise their sincerely held religious beliefs, their faith, must compromise their First Amendment <laughs> to, to satisfy the latest political craze or the, the, the latest change in, in, in culture of the day. Uh, that's why we have a Constitution, to protect us from, uh, from such pressures and and changes in, in what society views or approves of, and unfortunately, that judge just just doesn't get it. Well, we, as you know, we have some there's some pending cases uh, before the Supreme Court. Hopefully, we're going to have some good case law, and I'm uh, somewhat optimistic that as the Supreme Court moves in the correct direction, with uh, and the federal courts move in the correct direction with uh, fantastic appointments by President Trump, uh, I'm actually very optimistic in the long run. But right now, it's it's very challenging. Now, another thing. Craig, I want to talk about, and that is crime. Uh, it's sad to admit this, but uh, small businesses uh, are dealing with more and more cost, if you will, with regards to crime. And you were on a television show, the Var- Varney and Company at Fox News. I love to watch that show, by the way. Uh, he's, he's great. <laughs> um, but anyway, you were on that show talking about the, the challenges of crime to small businesses and laws in states like California that are very pro-criminal. I, there's no other way of defining it, very pro-criminal. And yet, in that show, just a few days after that show, something shocking happened to you that really made that point uh, in a major, in a very major way, in a very personal way. Uh, could you just uh, share, share what happened? Yeah, I, I was invited on uh, a national cable TV with Fox. And on Barney Company, I talked about this crime wave in California. You know, my business has been robbed, and uh, and uh, I, I've faced that. I know neighbors who have been robbed. But what I found out by a little of investigation, whether you're in low income, mid income, or higher income in the state of California, and other places as well, but in the state yeah. of California, there's this crime wave that's going on, and people are not being safe. So I talked about that. And, and gave examples how in Cal, uh, California they've released 40,000 criminals because of a proposition that basically uh, uh, gave them the power to release these uh, these criminals. 15,000 sexual predators have been released. 15,000 sexual predators? Correct. And, 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 and this is a decision of a judge, a liberal judge. And, and, and it, it's based upon a, pro, a Proposition 47 in California, which basically changed everything, including the laws related to juvenile uh, crime. And, and so uh, I, I got firsthand experience of that. So uh, about yeah. three days after I was on national TV, my 28-year-old son went down to a, a place close to our house that uh, it was a chicken place, and right. three teenagers came up to him to rob him. It was a, a planned robbery, and they pulled out a gun, and according to the gang division of, uh, of, of the Los Angeles Police Department, these are three gang members, and they started shooting my son. They started they shooting him. your son? Yes. Shot my son five times close range. Oh. And and, um, uh, and and he was begging, please stop shooting, and they kept shooting. And while he was lying on the ground, the two people with the shooters, the two teenagers with the shooters, actually were going through his pockets, 
and trying to get the keys to his car. And all of this was caught on camera, on the security camera, faces, activity, everything. So it's really clear they know who did it, and did they catch these people and arrest them and, and are being criminally prosecuted for attempted murder? Well, they all had a rap sheet. They all had the pictures. They arrested right. the two uh, that were with the shooter immediately. The what, about, what about the third? The third one, he is on the run. They think he might be in Mexico. Okay. And, but they don't know. He still could be local. And so the two were arrested, and they were in jail for 10 days. And the police said this was a premeditated murder attempt because they knew what their friend was going to do in shooting uh, my son. Right. And, and, um, and so basically uh, what happened after 10 days, they released these two juvenile delinquents, these two gang members, back into their high school. In, this, in their, the same high school. So same instead high of school. being in jail, prosecuted, put in a slammer, they're, they're back in their high school and there's no pending criminal charges as, as we understand at this point, right? That is correct. Jack oh, Lee good Lee night. The district attorney of the uh, county of Los Angeles basically are turning their back on crime like this because a law was passed that right. made juveniles untouchable in California. Yeah, that is just that is disgraceful, and yet that's what we have in some in states like California. You look at Illinois, folks. Uh, look at Chicago. Uh, look, look at what's going on in, to, to New York, moving in the wrong direction, and other places. Uh, so it's it's very serious. And it, and it, now I know everyone's wondering real quick before we end the show. Your son lived miraculously. It, it, doctors, everybody say it's an absolute miracle. Right. Uh, Shot five bull, times. The, right. Five times. Two bullets are still in him. But let me let me just tell you this. After uh, uh, he is out of the hospital after about three weeks, he's got a year of recovery. He's got seven. He's got nine uh, uh, doctors. He has to see. Uh, uh, every week. Uh, right. He may have to have surgery for his arm, but you know what? His healing is a miracle, too. So many people have been praying for him. So many people have been uh, lifting him up. I got to tell you, we see God's hand on this, and he's rededicated his life to wanting to make this yeah. a, a, a message. That he's got another chance. Right. God healed, is healing him, and right. he wants to give God the glory. But uh, I got to tell you, he's a victim. He's a victim of crime that should not have happened. Right. And he's uh, uh, and he's a victim of these criminals being mm -hmm. let go. The, uh, the 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 other victims are the other high school kids and people in the community. Right. Uh, these kids are are violent. They're gang members. Immediately after they got out of uh, right. out of jail, they went to the scene where my son was shot and did the gang symbols and oh. put on Instagram. Oh, well, you talk about lack of repentance. Anyway, um, all right, Craig, thank you so much for being on the show. We, we, we ran out of time, but I really appreciate you. And, and we have a, a resource, Faith in the Workplace, a training video. People can download that from our website if they'd like. It's very helpful also to help people in the workplace, including small businesses, uh, live and share their, share their faith. But, uh, Craig, keep up your great work in, uh, for Christ in business as well as a testimony of the the, the, the power and the, um, the, the, the love of God that we have in our life as we deal with so many uh, struggles in a fallen world that's even more fallen in places like California. God bless you again, and, and thanks for being on the show. Thanks. So my name is Adelmo. I'm 33 years old. I was born and raised in Brazil, came to America two years ago. I've been living here with my wife, got married two years ago. I came to faith in Jesus Christ around 17 years ago. I was living a terrible life in drugs and crime. Praise God, I had people coming and telling me about the faith in Jesus Christ. I understand that when you have something very good, you want to share it with people, especially if, if it is something that people need. And the gospel is something that people need. November 2015, it was a, it was a remarkable date for me. 
When I was uh, out there preaching, it was in front of a gas station. People didn't like the message and they called the police. The police officer came and I, I kept asking him, you know, what law have I broken? What, law, what crime have I committed? And he didn't have an answer to my, to my question. He just wanted my ID and I was trying to make sure that I was going to give him my identification as soon as I, I, I understood the crime I was committing. I stood my ground and he stood his ground and, well, he had the handcuff, so he put the handcuff on me. You know, it didn't make me afraid or anything. I was actually willing to be arrested if that's what it takes for me to be able to have my faith proclaimed. Even the Lord Jesus Christ himself was arrested for preaching the word that he preached. So I don't expect people to be behaving or treating me any better than what they did with the Lord. When I was arrested, uh, I, I didn't have any legal representation. They said I was going to spend 365 days in jail, pay a, a fine of $1,000, and I was going to be deported back to Brazil without my wife. And I trusted God that I, we were going to win, and praise God. Uh, they never prosec uh, prosecuted it, so they dropped the charges one day, two days before the trial. We at the Pacific Justice Institute are handling more and more cases just like Adamo's, where people are being victimized because of intolerance because of their faith. We're committed to defending the fundamental civil rights of individuals, and we're sort of unique in that we work hard across America to make sure that no one is ever left on the side of the road. No case is too small for the Pacific Justice Institute. And if you'd like to support the Pacific Justice Institute on either a one-time or an annual basis or a regular monthly basis, uh, we have a wonderful gift of appreciation for you. Uh, it's our opt-out forms. In fact, these are made available to anyone who wants them they're on our website, uh, pji.org. Just click at the top, Resources, and there you'll, you'll click uh, Parental or Parents, and, and then you'll see some, a number of different resources for parents, and one of those are opt-out forms. These are so valuable, so helpful to help protect your children or your grandchildren from a curriculum and materials that are coming down that are so outrageous and so objectionable. Once again, that's pji.org, pji dot org. To talk about one of these challenges that we're facing in public schools in the state of California and soon to be other places, uh, we have with us uh, here in the studio Attorney Michael Peffer. Michael, thank you for joining us. My pleasure, Brad. Thank you. Now, Michael, you head up our Southern California office. Uh, I know you've been very busy with uh, new requests for assistance. I know I think this time last year we had about 14 cases in active litigation. Now we have uh, 30 or 30 plus cases in active litigation just one year later. Uh, almost about half of those are uh, throughout the country, outside of California. So we're really helping people all across the country. And I know, the, but I know the country is watching uh, right now what's happening in California in particular because this is unfortunately going to be a, a bad precedent uh, if this is able to become really institutionalized like it seems to be in so many school districts. And what we're talking about uh, is dealing with uh, this uh, mandate, seeming mandate, to have a pro-gay, pro-transgender uh, indoctrination, only good things, in all of our public schools in California, all the way down to the kindergarten level. Tell me more. Yes, Brad, and, and, and by just a small segue, I, I want to mention, we have opt-out forms for, I, I believe, about 47 uh, states. So it's not just California uh, where it's it's oh, necessary yes. that parents are, are vigilant, right? I mean, we, right. We, we, that's why we've made it our, our, be, our endeavor to make this available for almost all the states. Right, and we also have uh, licensed affiliate attorneys uh, all throughout the United States. So, folks... If you're listening to this and you're in Maine or Massachusetts or Florida or Texas, wherever, never hesitate to contact us at Pacific Justice Institute. Uh, we're here to help you. We, uh, we have the resources, the people, and things like the opt-out forms uh, specialized for you and your particular needs in your particular state. 
That's okay, right. so what's going so, on with this? Uh, what's it called? The the um, California well, Healthy Youth Act. Correct. That was passed. First, talk about that. What did it say? Well, basically, to paraphrase. Uh, uh, yeah. Just in <laughs> essence, it says that all schools in California are required to provide curricula studies that are designed to say that there are homosexual people who have been great and positive and they've given to our society our society and so it's the requirement of the schools to educate the children as to things that are positive about this movement positive, positive gay role models actually presumed positive gay role models because exactly. going back in history they put labels on like Abe Lincoln and, and people that you go what I mean yes. obviously it's not yes so and 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 yeah. the thing that's that's kind of um scary about it I, you know there's a lot scary about it but it's the the law maintains no negative only positive but that's that's what we have right now no health consequences shorter lifespans high suicide rate None of that stuff. And we're talking about children. I mean, we're talking about kindergarten level. Oh, yes. So we're talking about children making decisions, particularly in, in puberty and in junior high and things like that, uh, then going into high school adolescence. Um, I mean, this is really, really serious because it's, it's like a big con job. It's a big uh, indoctrination process under the guise of this, of this state statute apparently mandating it. Now, one of the complaints that many parents have I mean, the concerns they have is they say, well, now, wait a minute. Can I opt out of this? Right. And that's the, – so the, 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 the main part of it is these positive messaging. But part of that is that schools have created a curricula which really goes into what, what formerly would be called obscene manners, uh, uh, vul vulgar ways of showing children – how these sex acts work and how what? Uh, how how all of this how this is designed and why this should be accepted and why it's okay so i mean it, i want to make sure <laughs> i want to make sure people get this because you you think well okay they're they're just saying gay is good you know great to be gay or great to be transgender transgenders but they're going into very specifics as to, I mean, they're very, they're separate, mind you. I don't want to say like they're one of the same. They're very separate. But like, for example, gay lifestyle. They they go in and actually talk about what people do to each other, uh, to children. I mean, that's a part. That's a part of it to make it normal, right? To make exactly. it exactly. Everyone say this is normal. This is wonderful, and try to get, sort of um, uh, numb everyone to the objectionable moral aspects uh, to this behavior that so many in America have. Exactly, and and so we've we've heard horrendous stories, and I'm not going to get into them here just because time is short. But but we've heard a lot of stories about things that are being taught to children, and parents they come home and talk to their parents, and they think, wait, wait, wh why is this being taught to my uh, second grader or my third grader? And so the bottom line is, I have to say, Brad, and this is something that you and I we've talked about a lot of times. Parental vigilance is really the only solution right now. The, the chief solution is parental vi uh, vigilance. Well, no, we, in the past, California required prior notice to parents and uh, making it very clear parents had a right to opt out their children of sex ed, when the material was going to be presented. But as I understand, that's no longer the case under the California uh, Health, Healthy Youth Act. Is that right? That's right. And, and I'll just say this. It's unclear at best. That's, that's the way I would put it. That You are absolutely correct. That has been the law. Affirmative notice was required. But this California Healthy Youth Act makes that murky. And it seems to say, in fact, it uses the word passive. And in mm. the law for this term, what that means is yeah. they're not going to get notice, but the parents still have the right to opt out their children. They just have to be the ones who, who are affirmative uh. in doing this, the parents, that is. Okay, so parents at all grade levels, if they're going to be responsible, they need to find out what's going on at their school. They need to talk to the school and say, do you have anything dealing with sex ed, anything dealing with – LGBT, anything like this at all. Um, and if it's dealing with sex ed or it's a part of sex ed instruction, so let's say you have LGBT as a part of sex ed instruction, uh, then parents can take initiative when they to find out and they can take initiative to opt out and they can use our opt-out forms 
And these opt-out forms, once again, we have them for 47 different states. There's right. no reason for parents not to utilize these opt-out forms to protect their children, no matter sure. what their state law is, and no matter you know, what, how their state works. So uh, this is really important, uh, but when we're dealing with something that's, say, outside of sex ed, comprehensive sex ed, like a history presentation, or you have a special, uh, say, tolerance presentation, quote-unquote tolerance, they could, can parents legally opt their children out of a special presentation that doesn't deal with sex ed, but does promote, aggressively promote this propaganda promoting same-sex sexual attraction lifestyles or transgender lifestyles? That is the part that the California Health and Youth Act changed. No, I do not believe that the parents can opt out of pure kind of historical social science discussions of 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 wow. of um, uh, pro homosexual um, a positive role models type of a discussion. Right. But but I, I also want to say is I I do not advise parents to wait. I think at the beginning of every school year they ought to be into this principal's office. Right. Um, and handing them this opt out. Right. No questions asked. When these topics come up, my child will not be there. And we have, Pacific Justice has provided notice for that. Yeah. And we'll defend those parents without That's right. charge. That's right. I mean, so we don't always say, here's the opt out form, you know, may God bless you. No, we say, here's the opt out form, may God bless you. And we at Pacific Justice will stand by you without charge to defend your rights. Uh, so that should be very empowering in and of itself. But I will tell you, Michael, this is, is so serious to any parent who has a child in a public school or a charter school. Those are also p- public schools. They have a lot of this material. Uh, and I, as I understand, uh, this California Healthy Youth Act, I understand it's impacting charter schools as well. It does. And, and this is very important for parents to realize is that charter schools have no greater rights to abstain from California Education Code than any other school. Uh, they are public schools within the meaning of that, from everything that that involves. Um, but, but, it, but one thing I want to say is that this has become yeah. kind of a social media thing right now, and that's right. why I believe it's important for us to talk about it uh, amongst other reasons, yeah. but but there, there's a, a memo that was created by um, some time ago by a, um, a an attorney general counsel for one of the local uh, county school boards, right? And that memo says that you cannot opt out of the sex education part of this, right? Uh, and we and we totally disagree with that. We completely disagree, Very good. and people and need I, to know that. That's yes. right, and we. I don't know whether this person. I've heard that has since walked this back. I don't know, and frankly, right. I don't care. Right. So we do not agree with that. We right. believe you can still opt your children out, right. and you ought to do so. Right, and also they need to encourage school districts, folks. If you're out there and uh, you're you uh, have a school district, and, and they're going to be putting on these presentations, they need to make sure that they. Uh, integrate these presentations that are required by the law with as and as a part of sex education. Because, folks, if this is integrated with sex education, then you can opt your child out of that because it's a part of sex education. If it's a part of comprehensive sex education, our position is you can opt your child out. Encourage your principal, your school district, not to separate these out, but to have them as a part of one comprehensive sex education curriculum and that gives you st- stronger legal grounds to be able to opt your child children out. Correct? That, that's correct. And another one other tool, real, real sure. quick. One other tool. You know, parents ought to be at school board meetings. There is curricula out there that is compliant with the California Health yes. and Youth Act, but it does not cause some of this obscene craziness. Right. So parents right. ought to be interacting. Some school boards actually still listen to parents. Right. So uh, you ought to be there. And, right. and you should say, hey, with all due respect— right. We don't want this explicit nonsense with our second and third grade right. children, yes. uh, period. We, we just don't accept right. it. Totally, I totally agree, Michael. I really do. And so, people, you need to be involved. You need to be aware of what's going on. And you need to get those opt-out forms. Michael, thank you very much for joining us on the program. My pleasure. And uh, we'll continue to watch this very, very closely. That's right. So, folks, there you have it. It's our God-given freedoms we're talking about. Now, let's choose to keep them. I'm Brad Dacus with Pacific Justice Institute. Have a great weekend.